Mandy, welcome to Future Speak. You've got a draconian organisation which is all about rules. Yeah, you need rules, I get that. Where it becomes so compliant, led, it stifles innovation, then you're going to be left behind. I was really, really looking forward to our conversation. You and I both had that shared philosophy of let's help the HR community to stay relevant. Before we really get into it, I would love for you to introduce yourself, tell our viewers and listeners who you are and what you do. My name is Mandy Withers and um, I run a business, well I run two businesses actually. Talk HR Solutions is the consultancy and that's been running for 17 years and I've learned a great deal of working with clients mainly in manufacturing pharmaceutical and life sciences in general. And uh, that's my sort of baby. And uh, I love running the consultancy. But my passion is actually the Talk HR Club, which was a concept that I thought about many years ago. Um, probably started working in earnest four years ago on actually pulling together a collaborative group of like-minded peers who are very abundant in nature and would love to work together, learn together and grow together. So at the moment I'm split across the two businesses, um, but I absolutely love what I do. It's, it's a passion of mine to help other HR consultants to do what I've done basically. You and I talk on a regular basis, um, you know, the future of work. What's been loud and clear, particularly through this series, is most people now recognise the fact that the future of work is here. Nah. But when I look at our conversations, a lot of the time we're talking about the fact that there's a lot changing, but we need our community, and I'm talking wider than, than just our, our, our club, the HR community as as a whole to keep up with the pace of change rather than stay in that operational role. And I'm being very careful there because this is a community I care about. I want them to to stay relevant. What are your thoughts on, on how they can best go about doing that? Yeah, I, I think you're right, um, Sam. You know, the future work is already here. I think somebody actually did say that. Um, and what it does is that and we've noticed through COVID particularly, there was accelerated bursts of change and that's going to keep coming our way. So we need to be future-proofing the way that we work as HR consultants. And I know as human beings, um, I care about this community as well, but we often get maybe uh, nervous about change and transformation generally, what's coming down the line. And interestingly, I had a conversation with my partner last night and we were talking about mobile phones. And mobile phones are not used just to ring people anymore. They're like mini computers in your hand. And if I think back about HR in general, where we started, when I started my career and where it is now, one thing's for sure, we've got to have to embrace what's coming our way because there's lots of opportunities. Yeah. Lots of growth, I think, from looking forward is that as individuals, we've got to learn to become more resilient and, and actually lead in this change. And I think it's a great opportunity for HR to become the leaders that they that they are already. Exactly. And I was at an event last week. I was really put on the spot, Mandy, and I did think about you because there was a room of 150, 200 people and it was Sam coming give us your view on where is this going for the HR community, particularly for those of us who have, you know, have our own consultancies or the L&Ds or the recruiters, those of, those of us who have small businesses that look after the bigger businesses. Right. And my take was we're the change makers. Yeah. But it's a chain reaction, right? So our role is to make sure that they still grow their businesses on on their terms. But our responsibility is also to help them stay relevant by asking them to think of how they run their businesses differently in order to bridge that gap between perhaps what they want to do and what their clients want to do. Yeah. And that was really, that was actually quite quite an interesting interesting thought to, to have developed on the hoof like that. But I saw a lot of HRs in the room nodding, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, I come across a lot of people in the HR space and community, freelancers in particular, 
And um, I think when they first start, they often their language is about themselves. And um, I often say to them, look, flip that, think about your clients. It's all about them. So with clients, you need to get under their skin, understand what they're going through because change is coming at them fast and furious. And they need somebody like HR to support the people side of the business. So you've almost got to be a few steps ahead of your clients so you can see what's coming down the line. So an example of this, I use the pandemic because it's probably a great example. During the pandemic, you had people that were um, probably quite comfortable dealing with crisis. So in my career to date, I've dealt with a lot of crisis management, disaster recovery. I felt quite comfortable when the pandemic happened, but I remember setting up calls with all my clients. And one of my clients who has been with me for 16 years actually had his head in his hands in front of the senior team. And he was showing really great vulnerability. And he said, I don't know how to deal with this. We've never experienced it. What do I do? And at that stage, I was probably just a few hours ahead of him listening to government updates and saying, it's okay, we'll you know, we'll work together, we'll get a plan. But what you did see was that the resilience of the team was really great and everybody sort of pulled together to actually react in that space. So when we looked at people in general, there were lots of people panicking, even from a human, human element, people out panicking, buying toilet rolls, for example, Whereas others were kind of almost reinventing and co-creating things. And a good example of that was a client near where I live now, and they were in automotion, automation, uh, car automotive, sorry. And they started to do ventilators. Now, they didn't actually try to fit it into their normal processes, but the skill sets that they had, they started thinking differently and co-creating with other companies. It wasn't just them. There was lots of companies coming together, collaborating and producing ventilators. This shows us how agile people are. The workforce, when you actually empower them and actually say, right, we're in this together, we can solve this. You were starting to see real innovation um, and flexibility on how to get those solutions. So I think as HR, we've got to be supportive of people really and help people to feel confident and not to have that panic mentality, that mindset of scarcity, really thinking more abundantly on how we can solve these things. So I do think that we've got to be able to enable people in the workforce to, to actually help solve problems. It's a massive capability. If you can solve problems, if you've got social and emotional intelligence to think differently, um, I think it's really fascinating. We're going to, it's quite an exciting time ahead. It shows that when there's a crisis, we really can do great work. It's already here. You know, we've just got to, we're already living into a new normal. What's the next pandemic or what's the next thing that's going to come our way? So I think the pandemic taught us a lot. It did. It really did. The point about resilience is huge. Indirectly through posts, you and I have been talking about anti-progenity recently and which again is the next stage isn't there of, of this resilience we we keep using all these terms quiet quitting great resignation we're almost self-perpetuating issues and challenges yeah. and and deflecting from to your point the good stuff that's coming yeah there's a mindset change we need in people and HR got to be part of that as well. I just think that if we are in a state of readiness, that you know we're going to be able to survive much easier. So if you've got machines coming in that are replacing what humans used to do, well, that just means that human beings could do more value-added activities. You know, HR traditionally has been a lot of transactional work, whereas you know it's kind of mundane, really, where we could be adding more value to to the workforce. Exactly. And I also think line managers have got a big role. I think line managers shouldn't be seen as somebody who's got a clipboard and doing compliance and checking on like KPIs, efficiencies, all of that. They should be empowering their people. They should be like, I believe, like the player or coach that helps people to be their best version of themselves in the workplace. There's so much compliance that it stifles innovation. How do we help the line managers? What does good line manager training look like? Mm. You see where I'm going, Mandy. What yeah. do you think? I think it's about 
developing some of their sort of emotional intelligence. It's more about capabilities, the ability to to learn, the ability Fair. to uh, problem solve, the ability to team. Because let's face it, some of the old models of supervision, you'd often see somebody like seeing it as a new power. You know, they've been promoted off the shop floor in manufacturing, for example, and suddenly you've got this power and they wield this thing and like power and really sort of conquer and divide their teams rather than giving the team what they want, getting on the field with the team and actually coaching them um, and, and ensuring that you can get the best out of people. I think you'd see a, a big difference because they would have the respect as well. So it's learning new skills, really. You know, you can have things like how to manage people more effectively, but at the same time, it's, it's the softer skills, I think. It's their capabilities more than than anything else. How to get yeah. the best out of other people. Yeah. And I recognize the fact that it's difficult for them, particularly because some of the new skills they're having to learn is hybrid, yeah. flexible, four-day weeks, new technology coming in. Mm. And that's that's not going to be easy, is it? Because I think that a lot of that comes down to trust. You know, do they trust their team to be working effectively? And a lot a lot of people may think, oh no, if I can't see them out of mind, they're not they're not doing anything. So it, you know, we had horror stories during we during the pandemic where people would um, be monitored at their computers. And they could see when they logged in, when they had a rest, when they logged off, all of that. I mean, when I started it as a supervisor, I mean, I literally had the traditional education and training, but they didn't prepare me for all the other things, the softer skills, the sort of the emotional intelligence, being self-aware, actually looking at the impact you had on people and how you could get so much more back from people. I think when you go into a rigid hierarchical structure, then it's this like power thing, isn't it? You know, mm. line managers are in the middle, filtering out messages from the shop floor and then filtering out messages from the top. But there's a big role for them to play. And I see that as a player coach in the future. How else do you see that line manager role changing? I think in the past, and maybe there's still some people today think that it's all about tasks, it's all about management. I don't think they think of themselves as leaders. Um, and, and really, you know, in a lot of line managers will look to HR to manage all the people side of things and they will like delegate it and say, well, that's what your job is. Well, actually, no, it's your team and we'll guide you and advise you and support you, but you've got to take that on because it's probably the most powerful thing that you're ever going to do in being successful in making a difference to the bottom line. It, it starts with them, it ends with them. I think HR is there just to support and advise and empower empower them. If I look back at some of the work that I've done, it's always been through the line management. I've got the best success. And you've got to give away the trust. You've got to gain the respect and give them the tools to help them to do the job. But you don't do it for them. Yeah. Earlier on in the year, there's been quite a bit of spotlight on the whole line manager role in terms of, well, that role is going to change significantly. Some some have said up to 60% by 2025. Wow. But yet no one's talking about that from a reality, from a, a now perspective. What does that look like? Are they saying that a lot of these roles will go? Well, potentially, perhaps. Or are they saying that actually that line manager role evolves? And I'm really curious to see that because there's a big buzz at the moment around this line manager training, uh, yeah. upskilling them. And yet, on the other hand, we're being told that there's a huge change coming for them. And it goes back to what I said earlier, this this bridge between what we're seeing now operationally and, and our day-to-day -day reality versus, versus what we're reading here. I also think that, you know, the workforce they're dealing with is very different, though. Sam, so a traditional workforce has changed, isn't it? And you've often huge. got... If I say to one of my business owners, you know, what's your workforce like? They'll talk about they've got managed services, they've got freelancers, they've got employees, they've got gig workers, they've got a real mix. So it becomes probably more fluid than it's ever been in the past. And, you know, the way that we'll go forward, I'll see like HR, for example, may work for a company for a little while, 
and then they'll go out and freelance and do something else. So a lot of things in the past are all being broken down, being deconstructed. So we would, years ago, I used to say to people, you get three career, career changes. Well, now it's more of a portfolio. They're going to have 14 career changes and it, it'll be like a portfolio rather than the ladder that we were all told yeah. to climb. There's a traditional ladder, you know, you would go into uh, an organization and you would train yourself, you know, educate yourself or the company would support you and you go up the ladder and then, then that, and then you would retire. So it was a traditional, you know, get educated, go to work, uh, keep educating yourself, training, and then retire. Now people are going to live for much longer, but they're going to be moving around a lot more. They might do three years in one place, move on to another. We're not going to have workforces which have been like, you know, boy and man in the same job. Um, and that's more challenging for those line managers because they're almost working with people on borrowed times and mixture. You'll have like sort of super teams, I think, where they'll be, you know, they're going to have to be really agile to manage the different types of workers. Yeah. And that also then means that the HR community as a whole needs to adjust how they operate, doesn't it? Yeah, because you're going to want people to be working as a team. You know, you create these super teams. I suppose in terms of in-house HR, they've got to look at people who are on site or working remotely. What are their sort of honest, their superpowers then, if you want to call it um, that? Because we hire people for skills and abilities, but they'll be there. What's their capabilities? You know, where's the problem solvers? Where's those people that got great ability to learn? Who are the change agents? You know, I've always been a change agent in my career. Uh, and I often came up against people who said to me, stop causing too many ripples in the pond because I was challenging the status quo, even asking those curious questions. It wasn't kind of norm for them. So I'd always be asking why, 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 why? We need more of that. And, and, I, and I think back to my organizations I worked in, often there was group think. You'd all just fall into line. And, you know, if you were to step out of line and say something else, then, you know, you'd be shoved it down. So we need to encourage that innovation, uh, co-creation, you know, all the things that make the organization better from an individual's perspective as well. And if machines are going to come in and fast track a lot of things, then let the machines take the AV wait, you know, uh, I, you know, it's not something that people should be afraid of. I, I don't think, you know, I've had customers, clients who brought in robotics and people are really nervous and we're having to reassure them and saying, look, you get to do more value added activities, but it's, it's going to be quite a transition for a lot of people. It's happening as we speak, you know, um, AI is in lots of things, you know, from an HR perspective, I look at consultants and. I'm constantly looking at technology that can help us to enable our clients to do what they need to do even better. Fair. So I'll give you an example, um, mental health, well-being. We throw lots of things at it, but do we ever take a really a good sort of benchmark in an organization? Are we using AI to actually measure where that organization is? Then looking at appropriate solutions and then measuring again. But we don't need to have like uh, cumbersome sort of processes of there's somebody in the HR office collecting data, trying to understand it. Well, AI can come in and do all of that and do it yeah. very easy. Absolutely. And you've got me thinking, so we're talking about mindset and you and I are very similar in asking lots of questions and using our natural curiosity and why and how are, are questions. I ask all the time. I hear you asking it all the time. Is there a piece here beyond mindset, beyond the emotional piece that's around actually identifying the right behaviours that we want to nurture in organisations moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, if I look at, I mean, I'm a small business myself. I'm going to be taking somebody else on and I'm more interested in the outputs, not the times that they clock on or clock off. It's about getting them to do their best work. So it's got me thinking recently as well. Traditionally, we've had a job description and it's quite prescriptive. It's about tasks. 
but often we don't look to sort of play up to people's strengths and to get some real nuggets of knowledge. Um, sometimes it's overlooked in organizations because we try to put people in boxes. And I think it's, it's really about stepping back and looking at where people's behaviors are best suited. So if I, if we look at sort of diversity of individuals and inclusiveness of individuals, if I look at somebody that's neurodivergent, for example, then putting them into an area which they're really creative and they're allowed to to use their creativeness is much better than trying to put them into a job and they're struggling on performance and the Fair. line manager is saying, well, they're not up to the job and then they performance manage them often out of the organization. Whereas if they had actually looked at where they're best suited and where their behaviors are more comfortable to get the best out of them, you could have saved from losing someone, but there's a, a lack of knowledge as well. So um, DEI is really at the top of the agenda as well with well-being, um, mental health. So it's it's looking at that people are very individual, and you know it's 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 looking at how they behave. But you set a culture of behavior as well. Say this is how we work around here. This is how we do things. But you're also listening to what they're bringing to the table as well. Fair. It's crucial, isn't it, Rune? Yeah. And yeah, I was having a conversation earlier today about just that. And and this is the first time we've ever had it, right? If we've got a C suite here who are, are stuck and they're not sure how to do things, and yet you've got the next generation coming through who've got ideas, it's making sure that the two connect where one is allowed to share and use their exuberance to share creative ideas um, whilst those with the experience recognize that yes they've got that experience but how do they remove the filters and barriers so they're not jaded by it yeah to, to get the best out of it and that is that we're going to see an increase in incidence of that kind of stuff happening as well aren't we yeah yeah absolutely and i think from an hr sort of viewpoint as hr the role is more, it's become wider, more embracing. I think the pandemic has helped HR to be leaders in their own right. And it's how we sustain that. But, you know, it's almost just being ahead of, of the curve, really. Um, and getting that recognition at the top table as well. And not being afraid to influence. And sometimes be the one that steps out from group think. It's okay. Um, and have that confidence to do that. Uh, you know, a lot of the time when I look back on my career, there was often intuition came into play. And, yeah. you know, I would often say, look, this is an intuition I've got. And it never let me down um, because often my MD, CEO, would be so busy on maybe like 12 months down the line, but I would be reading situations, reflexing situations, and, and actually sort of, you know, listening to make sure everybody was on the same path. So it sounds like when I'm talking, Sam, I think, some of it is a bit vague because we, 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 we've got uncertainty, like any change coming forward, what the future looks like, but we're starting to see some of these trends. And I think you often have to just pilot things, tweak it, um, and create that safe space for people to say there's no such thing as a bad idea or a poor question. We want to encourage that because as an organization, they're going to be more profitable. They are going to be ahead of the game. But if you've got a draconian organization, which is all about rules, yeah, you need rules. I get that. But where it becomes so compliance-led, it stifles innovation, then you're going to be left behind. Absolutely. So, and, and and also, line managers not sort of seeing that line management responsibility is, I've got the power, I'm in charge, you do what I say. And, yeah. and sometimes HR can be like that, where they say, the computer says no. So actually, you need to think outside the box a little bit more. What can be made possible? Yes. And looking at every opportunity and not being afraid of it. Because sometimes I think HR will feel this this fear because they're afraid. They don't want to get anything wrong. They don't want to end up getting the you know the client in trouble and, uh, or the, the internal HR doesn't want to get their employer into trouble. So, you know, it's it's about peeling back those things and saying, okay, intuitively, you know, I'm comfortable in my space. If I don't know, I'm going to find out. But really be that barometer between employees and upper management and actually don't be afraid to break that group think, to say, I've got 
an idea. And to facilitate that changing how we think, that that's a huge piece. And it's interesting, I'm seeing sort of two sorts of HRs, those who are all about the change and, okay, we're just going to go with it. We were talking here early on today about having a, you know, a mistake tax or a test tax or a test budget or something like that, which is, okay, we're going to put this money aside. This is the money that where we play with stuff. Yeah. Be that a new HR system or a new way of recruiting or a new way of coaching and training our teams, but something that we look at differently. And then those who will constantly say, I can't wait till we go back. Yeah, because there's there's that mindset of we've done so many different initiatives, we've been here before, it's not going to work. So they're the doubters. They, they will doubt what, what's coming ahead. So you've got to embrace them and get them on board. Find out what makes them tick, you know, or what's their fears. Absolutely. It, it's it's about the fears, isn't it? Where, where are the fears there? And right. interestingly, we I was reminded through recording this series, someone who said, well, 20 years ago, I would print out, I would fax through the timesheets. They would sign the timesheets and send them back. You would give out a pay slip. And we were having a conversation where I said, well, actually, you've just made me remember something. When I started work, I would... If I wanted to send an internal memo, I would write the memo, I'd have a template, I'd write the memo, I would put it in a, an envelope, I would cross out the previous recipient's name, and I would put the next recipient, either the person I wanted it to go to, I would then handle it to the internal mail boy or girl, who would deliver it probably the next day yeah. to where I wanted it to go within the organisation. So obviously I'm talking a large organisation. Fast forward today where obviously we send an email, so that's instantaneous, or a WhatsApp, or a Slack message, or a, you get the drift. Yeah. And let's take that to the next degree, which is if you then do have people in the office, say, on a once a week or once a month, your out of office says, I am in the office and not taking in mails mm. because you're actually there. So we've always come full circle with that. And that's a nice reminder for those of us who are feeling fearful, you've actually been through seismic change for the last 20 years and that didn't bother you. Why is this mm -hmm. any different? Yeah. And that's an interesting way of looking at it, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of us have been around for a long time. I've seen lots of changes and uh, embraced those. And, you know, when I had a company fire, that did really rock me because it was like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And, you know, set up a crisis room, disaster recovery. But the training, the resilience that came with that helped me set up my own business. But importantly, it's helped me serve my clients who've gone through lots of changes and, and been able to take a lead with them as well. And they trusted me to do that. Um, so there is an element of if you've experienced it, then you should be you know, more open to what's coming down the line, really, and not be afraid of it. I understand if people have not been through big change, but it's there, it's been there for a long time. We've just sometimes taken things for granted. Absolutely. But the first mobile phone was like a brick. <laughs> and look at it now. <laughs> we were talking about that today. And I said, I remember when my dad walked in mightily proud with this big brick. And the next ones, do you remember, in the middle of the, the console, you, you picked it up yeah. and as you were driving, you hit the numbers. Yeah. Can you imagine doing that today? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, you got pulled over by the police. Listen, I'm retro. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think this is exciting. I think there's a lot of opportunity. Of course, there's lots of fear. I feel the fear sometimes. Of course, I do when someone says, hey, there could be a coaching app that replaces me one day. Of course, there could be. Well... They are building apps already, aren't they? Which, you know, a lot of um, coaches are using apps. And, you know, I get a lot of people in my community say, I don't like apps. And I'm like, well, I've got an app come in. And they're like, oh, I love apps. Some people say they love them. Some people don't. But it's all, everything's got to be so quick these days, isn't it? You know, and, and if you don't keep up with it, you kind of get left behind. Exactly right. And I, it's a blend of the two, right? So, you know, we have pre-recorded stuff. Of course we do, um, and we, we have that 
that personal one-to-one there's there's a place for all of it and this is what I'm hearing across the board what's your vision what do you hope for the future I think for me the actual sort of automation so AI and all those of digital interventions I think they're great I think it's about focusing on people as people so if I think about my own organization you know M comes to work with me and it's like M bring your full self to work that's a very different viewpoint to when I started it was like at work I was booted and suited and outside of work I was a different person right. and I felt you know, looking back, it was like there was a shortfall there, whereas now people are, we're talking to people in their living rooms, in their bedrooms, yeah. you know, their Zoom call. It's like you see the full authentic self for people. I think business is not as rigid and as formal as it used to be. I think it's a good thing. I, I think there's that sort of connection. I think there's deeper connections with people because at the end of the day, we've all got the same needs and wants. It's, you know, a closeness that means that we can achieve more together, you know, and I think there's, there's less egos about as well. I mean, I, uh, when I was in uh, early career, I would be the only female in the boardroom and it used to be, you know, I used to think, well, gosh, you know, I, I could like to see more females and it's like, how do we encourage them? You know, and I lived in an area which it was like, well, you didn't go and set up your own business back in the day. It was like, well, who do you think you are with your own business? And I'm like, what? But it's like trying to help people to to go down the line as far as they can. You know, say, well, I'm happy with where I'm at, and I'm I'm giving my best self. You spend a long time in work, um, and um, you know, I see work as more of a vocation because I'm doing something I really love. I know I'd hate to be those people on a Sunday night thinking I don't want to go into work tomorrow. Oh, I've got a yeah. terrible manager. I don't like the nature of the work that I'm doing. I don't like the values of this organization. And there's a lot of people up and down the country which feel like that. So, it, you know, for me, it's about living your best life, whatever that's going to be. And what's your dream and vision for the club? Oh, my God. The dream and vision for my club is, well, it's not my club. It's led by the members. I want them to lead their best lives. So as consultants, freelancers, they are literally having a ripple effect on the world of work. They're making a real difference in the workplace and they feel fulfilled and they live in their lives and um, being really, really happy because for me, happiness is the key to success. If you're happy, then that that, that, that for me is, is the number one reason why I do what I do because I, I love to see others getting on. And if they're happy in what they're doing, I've I've done something and had an impact on them. I'm a big collaborator. I don't Fair. need to compete because to me it's about I want to learn from others. They can learn from me. We can go further down the track together. So I've already gone up. It's coming down the line, and I've had mixed reactions. Um, but I'm like, gosh, it's going to make your life so much easier. Fair. Absolutely. And, and take away the fear. And, and I say this to them a lot. I come from a place of love, genuinely. And some of them say to me, oh, that's stuck in my brain, coming from a place of love. And I said, if you come from a place of love, you'll be amazed what results come out. If you come from a place of fear, then things always seem to go wrong because you're waiting it, for things to go wrong. Exactly. Exactly. And to your point about collaboration, that's where we, we are at, I right. think, in, in general right now. It's we continue to collaborate with technology it's not going to take over no it's how we collaborate with it yeah and yeah. that's a lovely way of putting it i think and you know work which a workplace has changed the normal workplace description was a physical building for that workplace it's becoming more like a community sam so I'm already talking to other people in the manufacturing space who've got developers and they've got an online app and we look to work together. So there's a community over there. There's one over there. So how can we all work together and help each other? So in the manufacturing startup space, they're looking for HR. They're looking for trainers. They're looking for interims. They're like, help us to get our businesses off the ground. And some of them are going to go really skyrocketing. Sure. And they're collaborators. You know, they're bringing in all sorts of people. And, um, and it's so interesting. I'll show my platform to some other platform. They go, that's interesting. You've got an interactive space where they're talking to each other. And go, yeah, oh, well, I'd like to do that for my community. How did you do that? And um, 
it, it's great because we can see that's what the future looks like. Exactly. Exactly. And Mandy, fun question coming up for you. Okay. As a busy lady, I'm not sure if you have time for this, but we're going to give it a go. What was your last Netflix binge watch? Last one. Oh, so, well, binge watch. Actually, i got to say that it was a film I saw recently. i got to recommend this film. It's called Starfish. It's more of a documentary. And it's a true story based on a guy that developed sepsis. Oh, and wow. He lost his arms and his legs. And he overcame that, was one of the most resilient people I've ever seen. And his wife was amazing in the film, but the the emotional human side of it was really fascinating. So the message of despite any adversity, human beings can overcome it. So I think that's pretty apt really for what we're talking about. You know, in adverse times or challenging times, we can overcome most things. Brilliant. I'm going to have to make a note of that and go look it up. Yeah. Thank you, Mandy. And anyone listening to this today who is an HR leader, be they an HR consultant or in-house, and they're not sure which direction to go, what one takeaway would you want them to get from our conversation today? I think one takeaway would be to come from a place of love and believe in yourself and understand what your purpose is in life. And, you know, just go for it. There's lots of people that will help you on that path to discovering what you're meant to be doing right now. So you've got nothing to lose. You know, I would say if anybody's thinking of freelancing, just do it. Absolutely. Just do it. You and I both know that it's a wonderful world in the freelance world. There's great communities out there. I'm a huge advocate of the Talk HR Club, as you know, and love everything you're doing. So thank you for coming on today, Randy. Uh, thank you, Sam. My pleasure. And we'd love to have you on another series as the club continues to grow and we continue to see where the world of HR and work takes us. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day. It's been lovely speaking to you. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Sam. Take care.